You see, okay, now, okay, now recording is progress, very good. So, uh, yeah, so it was really great to be invited to give this first talk in this seminar here. And uh, yes, I'm very much pleased with that. And uh, let me just uh, start that I will be talking about machine learning of topological defects, about some specific thing, I would say, very specific direction in uh, logic theory. Also, the uh, idea was suggested to be that uh, we are uniting mathematics with physics. Right now, it little debate towards computer science in that direction to give you some flavor of uh, uh, machine learning, how it is applied to physics. And I would like to say that it's a very, very um, kind of very small aspect of what we are doing or what people are doing in uh, physics and from the point of view of uh, numerical machine learning technique. It's very interesting. And uh, I would like to say that it's this talk is, um, some people may, may, may find it kind of trivial. Others can say that it's totally incomprehensible. It's totally kind of foreign to mathematics and physics at all. And some may find that it's kind of magic. So all of that is kind of united and the these three things are entangled when we talk about machine learning and uh, high energy physics. So, okay, so first of all, I would like, okay, let me just kind of general introduction and the, um, uh, what I want to do is say that uh, this is actually not only my work, it's work also of a couple of my collaborators, uh, Harold Derbin, who's right now at MIT Cambridge and also two Russian colleagues from Vladivostok. And uh, yes, and there are also other authors, but I, I will mention them later. Uh, first. Uh, okay, so the approximate plan of this talk is the following. First of all, I would like to understand or to, to describe why we need machine learning in uh, um, in field theory, in uh, high energy physics, and I will speak in this particular way about QCD, where we have a big problem with understanding of confinement on the phase diagram. Then, so to be basically motivation, uh, why do we use machine learning? Uh, then I will describe in a very general way the machine learning itself and what are artificial uh, neural networks. So I will, this will be scattered all, all over the text. Uh, after that, I will speak about the specific model where everything is understood. So both analytically, numerically, and then we can use it, uh, this model to test uh, machine learning to understand how neural networks can be applied to this particular model and what we can get of that given the fact that we understand it both numerically and analytically. And then uh, I will move to the domain which of domain of unknown, of kind of getting or getting physics from unphysics. So getting physics from, uh, that I will explain what does it mean, uh, how to get uh, the uh, results uh, from machine learning in uh, realistic experiments. By realistic, I mean simulations, first principle simulations where we have data in which we are sure and we would like to understand them. Okay, and then I will mention future developments. And if I have time, I will also mention about some applications, for example, for measurement of vacuum energy, <clears throat> how machine learning can be applied to measuring, to measuring vacuum energy in some specific models and eventually applied to real world. And I would like to ask that, to say that if you have any questions, please interrupt me. Better that we all understand what's going on, then I will just talk, 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 talk <laughs> in front of the flat screen. So please interrupt me and ask me. So I think we have time. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the big motivation of all our um, studies of kind of deviation towards machine learning from standard method was the phase diagram of QCD. So this QCD is quantum homodynamics, a theory of strong interactions. And basically uh, what we have here, we have uh, the theory of strong interactions, we have uh, two types of constituents. That's a quarks uh, and gluons. So quarks, these are uh, entities from which the uh, uh, we are actually made of. So it, the the neutrons and the protons are made of quarks, and they are coupled together via interactions of gluons. So the theory is quite simple. If you write it on the blackboard, it's just one line, but it's totally non-understandable. We don't understand this diagram how it behaves uh, at all. So for example, this is one of the examples. So if you take uh, just the phase diagram of the QCD, uh, here is temperature and here is baryon chemical potential, so-called potential, so basically density. 
uh, you'll get this complicated diagram, which is basically the guess, because uh, neither theoretically uh, nor, okay, I would say, neither numerically nor ex experimentally, we cannot uh, recover this phase diagram. This analytical guess, uh, and there are other suggestions for this type of diagrams here. So let me say that this is temperature, and this, for example, this scale of temperature is approximately 10 to 12 uh, Kelvin, 10, 10 to the power of 12 Kelvin. So actually it should be more or less equal two times two with uh, uh, 12 zeros Kelvin. So it's huge temperature of the order of QCD scale. And at this particular temperature, our hadron vacuum, basically our vacuum melts and it becomes a quark gluon plasma. The quark gluon plasma existed in the early universe, at the first moments of the early universe. And it can also be created in heavy ion collisions where we have two ions and smash them with a high velocity high energy and they create fireball here, which expands and which actually starts somewhere from here, from very, very high, very high temperatures and then goes down when it expands. And uh, when they're colliding them, uh, we see actually the particles which appear from the, what we say, hadronites, which appear from the collision and we try to guess what's going on inside and that, uh, that collision. Collision is very brief. It takes approximately one yocto second. So it's 10 to minus 24 seconds. It's very short, but still just reconstructing uh, from measurement of what's going uh, from measurement of, uh, of, of the result of the collision, you can understand what was the temperature, what was the evolution of the plasma, thermal one, hydrodynamic one, and so on. Uh, you can understand what's going on, but still, one must say that uh, still all our, uh, yeah, and those collisions, they are done in the, uh, uh, they are measured uh, in uh, the, sorry, the the experiment start from at RIC at the Brookhaven Laboratory close to New York, near New York. And now they're continuing in at least six experiments at the, the border between uh, at CERN and the border between uh, Switzerland and France. And those collisions, they are appear basically this region. So it's uh, low, this, this is density uh, of matter. So low density, low density uh, region where uh, the um, exp expanding fireball expands and goes down, it goes down with this temperature and evolves somehow in density, becomes less dense, as you can see. So, and those collisions, they cannot still reach this point. So it's just, there is an idea of low energy scan, but it still cannot reach this point. At least we don't have kind of exact position of the point where, um, and this point uh, implies that uh, somewhere at density uh, temperature diagram, there is uh, this kind of end point of first order phase transition. So here we have first transition line between low temperature gas and high plasma. And in between them, there is a transition region. Moreover, there is even worse. If you just look uh, at low density region, which is zero by the chemical potential and start here, we can perfectly simulate on the lattice, we can perfectly simulate this line, while this line is not actually for us, it's, it's, it's not it's not possible because um, it turns out, I don't have time to, to deal with that in detail in this talk, but it turns out that it's impossible to simulate dense thermionic matter or even dense bosonic matter in um, on the lattice, I mean, in numerical simulations, it's totally impossible. So we can only guess what's going on here using some approximate method. But if you have zero density, so if you have basically vacuum and you start to heat it, you know that when you heat it, uh, just with some collisions or with something else, if you approach this point, you know that at some high temperature, you will finally find the quark gluon plasma. That's uh, when quarks are moving around, they're deconfined because in our zero temperature world, basically, we are working basically zero temperatures, quarks are confined into, into neutrons and protons. And here we know that vacuum melts basically. And this temperature is approximately 155 MeV, the temperature of first transition. We know uh, all characteristics. It's really difficult to do the simulations and uh, we need supercomputers, but we know numerically basically all the details, what's going on there. Also, there are a lot of questions, of course, but you don't know the mechanism. We don't know why here we have quarks which are confined into protons and neutrons. So we have, uh, we cannot take out quarks of proton and neutron. They are inside, they're confined, they are glued together and it takes huge energy to take them out. Uh, but once we take it out, then uh, they do not come alone. They will come always with, with pairs of so quark and anti-quarks. So they will always kind of confined into some bags and uh, which we call hadrons. So why we have here confinement and here we have the confinement when we have the soup of those atoms or sorry, or of those protons and sorry, or those quarks around so that are not bind into 
into, into proton synchrotron. So that's basically, I would like to say that uh, here at this line where we have zero density and huge temperature, we can do that numerically. We still don't understand what's going on with the theory. So we have everything, we have our simulator, we have our supercomputers, but we don't understand the physical mechanism. And uh, it was a problem which appeared many years ago, um, I think decades ago, and uh, people still have big question marks. There are many models. So the idea was whether we can understand what's going on here at least, or close to that point from machine learning, and then go to higher regions where, for example, uh, we can see, for example, this where we have low temperature and uh, relatively low temperatures and high burning density, we can reach cores of neutron stars, we can get to some very uh, unusual color superconducting regimes, which are suggested, but uh, have not seen, uh, we cannot see it neither numerically nor analytically, okay, only analytically, but not neither numerically nor experimentally. So the idea is that to explore the region of strong interactions and finally come to the region of early universe, understand what, what was there. So that was a big aim. And since we don't understand it, okay, our, our intelligence is not enough to understand that. We say, okay, there is artificial intelligence, let's just delegate this task to artificial intelligence because uh, good chiefs, usually a good, uh, uh, good heads of departments, they know how to delegate. And right now we delegate our knowledge to uh, artificial intelligence and ask, okay, guy, please come and solve it. So right now I will try to move in that direction and say, how can we delegate that to this problem, physical problems, artificial intelligence, and try, I would say artificial intelligence, in reality it's neural network and some specific computer programs, uh, to, under, to ask a question whether we can understand what's going on in this so-called non-perturbative domain of quantum chromodynamics. And before going to that, let me first uh, say that what is quantum chromodynamic is, because right now I have shown only a diagram, in fact, it's a very simple, it's a very simple theory. If you write it in one line, it's just PCD Lagrangian. So you have gluons, uh, gluonic part, and then the billion gluonic part, which in the PCD case of PCD is uh, SU3, uh, um, SU3 gauge symmetry, so 65 SU3 gauge symmetry. And here we have quark part, which I write in the symbolic form. These, they have some seed masses and also uh, some, uh, some some isovectors made of Dirac uh, fermions, massive Dirac fermions interacting minimally with uh, uh, the um, gauge field, uh, which is in this case gluon field, which carry color index R8, running from one to eight. So, okay, this one line theory, and we don't understand it, I would like to say. Moreover, in this, in this work, I will be talking about theory, which does not contain quarks at all. So if you have only this part, which is this were a simple one, so we don't understand it at all as well. So we cannot we cannot say why this theory, for example, is confining, why it has mass gap generation and other fascinating phenomena. So we don't know. We have simulations, we can do them, we can do it at arbitrary precision, I mean, a thermodynamic limit and at, at, at a thermodynamic equilibrium, but still we have questions. So, and machine learning should serve to understand what's going on really in the theory. Okay, so uh, yes, and uh, I must say that this theory, let me just right now flash this transparency because I don't have time to really come here to this particular point and come deeply. Uh, so uh, as I said, there are two phases here uh, at this line. So we have a high temperature phase and low temperature phase. This fine phase is the confinement where quark can spread uh, everywhere and just move around. And this phase is confining where a quarks, 90 quarks or three quarks together are bound into hadrons. So they cannot move except for moving together in the form of bound state. So this is confinement phase and this is the confinement phase. And then you put system on the lattice. So you discretize the world and uh, simulate it as in, in computer. Then uh, th there is a question, what is the parameter which distinguishes between two phases? How do you discriminate between them? And uh, this parameter is called Polyakov loop. It's just the um, okay, just the integral, uh, just ordered integral of fourth component uh, of the gluon field along the compactified direction. Okay, right now I wanted to say that because um, I don't have, I mean, again, time to describe this in details. But once, uh, if you want to just discuss the um, gauge theory or any theory in a, a thermodynamic equilibrium, one of the best ways to put the system in the computer, maybe the single one, effective one, is just to um, um, consider the um, rotation from the, of the theory from Minkowski space where we live to Euclidean space, just uh, consider big, big, big rotation. So just rotate time to imaginary time 
call it X4 instead of X0 and then compactify it. So to make it, uh, to make this direction uh, short. And this short direction, which is here is known as tau, is uh, inversely, the length is inversely proportional to temperature, just one over T. And where T is temperature. So, and this compactified direction will signal time. And if you consider this integral along this time along uh, of a core component of the theory, uh, then at this point it will become order parameter. It means that it will be related actually to the free energy of a single quark. So, if you take single quark, put it in the in the vacuum, uh, this quantity will become exponent of minus free energy divided by temperature. Since we work at non-zero temperature, then this quantity is finite usually. But if you are in confined regime, it's impossible to put quark in the vacuum. It means that free energy is infinite and this quantity is zero. So at low temperature, we have basically um, this quantity is zero. So order parameter is zero and we are in confinement regime. But once uh, we are able to liberate quark and if it can, if it can move freely, then uh, free energy becomes uh, constant or I would say non-infinite. And this quantity is also becoming non-infinite. So then expectation value of polycol loop becomes non-infinite and then we can distinguish between the two phases. So zero in confinement phase and then zero in deconfinement phase. And that's how unlikely we define where we are. Okay, and that's what happens in experiments normally. So it's, uh, we cannot, you can just disregard what is written here. Basically, uh, you have many points here which collapse into the single curve, which say that actually the results, lattice results are perfect, very good. So here is temperature and here is a uh, polycov loop. And it, and it says that at low temperature, we have quantity close to zero and large temperatures, we have non-zero. And we have smooth crossover regime between hadron phase and quark gluon, the plasma phase, which signals smooth transition between confinement and the confinement regimes at the temperature approximately okay approximately 170 mv that's that's is done yeah MQCD, but okay I, I also i don't have time to discriminate between different types of transitions here but it's smooth crossover so we don't have really phase transition here but still we have some kind of transition between confining low temperature phase and the confining phase okay good and so again what is confinement? So zero temperature quark uh, gluons form bound states. They are called hadrons and maybe gluons, which are made only from gluons. Also, one can say that they have some admixture of uh, quarks as well uh, in the real world. But we have some confined, uh, confined uh, quantum excitations which don't care the called color it's at all. So it's, it's not, they don't have gauge degrees of freedom. And then, so confinement of this color uh, occurs, confinement of quarks uh, is due to dynamics of gluons, not quarks. So that's why we can, we can disregard quarks, dynamical quarks from our theory, assuming that we don't have virtual quarks and we work only with gluons. So we can consider pure thermal theory. So it, uh, the pure, pure new theory means that we work only with this part of Lagrangian, disregard quarks. And then we can introduce uh, static quarks, which are probe quarks, to study their free energy using this operator, which is Polyakov loop in the theory. And then, uh, since, as I said, mechanism of confinement is not understood, uh, we, okay, we can ask ourselves, how can we understand it? So what are, can, can be the models which are, which are responsible for confinement? And in fact, there are many models. <laughs> there are models which are based on so-called center vortices, abelian monopoles, and abelian colorons, some instant on dion, so some semi classical configurations in the vacuum, many, many different models. I will not overview them here, but I would like to say that theoreticians have very nice imagination. And we'd like to ask what is the real truth? How many, how can we join those communities? Because every of those, each of those models have some deficiency, they have some problems. And what is the result? How, what is, how, how world is uh, really created? And uh, I mean, how this world of how confinement is created in this world, why right? it's, why it is so, I mean, we would like to ask. And uh, to that, to answer this question, yeah, we uh, come to first principle lattice simulation, which simulate our world. So we see the color confinement or quark confinement in different worlds uh, in the first principle lattice simulations. We know that we have configurations. We have lattice configurations of gluons, basically frozen configurations of how gluons are distributed around, how they fly, we know them. And we know that those configurations are confined but we don't know, we don't understand why. And the reason is that uh, there are too many years of freedom. You have billions and billions of data, <laughs> terabytes of data in your computers, and this is big data problem. So you have a lot of data and you would like to understand what's going on inside. You need kind of single answer or short answer, and it's impossible because there are numbers, numbers, and numbers. 
And uh, now we turn to, to machine learning because it's a computer science uh, which uh, deals with big data. It deals in our world, and we'll describe it later, uh, just very shortly. So motivation of this talk, again, is how can we recognize mechanism of color confinement with machine learning? So I would like to stress this is motivation and not the aim, because it turns out to be very difficult, and I will explain why. So there are many developments in the fields, and this is just a very short uh, slice of uh, papers. There are a lot of number, a lot of papers here. Uh, latest one appeared basically a few days ago on the confinement, on the confinement problem and the machine learning which people try to, to approach it with machine learning uh, quite recently. Uh, but there are many, many papers on the subject, so I don't have time to overview all of them, but I will, I will overview a little bit. So, okay, now we are talking a lot about machine learning. The question right now is, what is the machine learning? So it is defined in various ways. Uh, one of the first definitions came, um, okay, you see, like 50, uh, like 60 years ago. So that's field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. That's the definition of machine learning. Another definition, uh, which appeared later, also in a very famous book, it's a little bit more mathematical. It's computer. It's a computer program. A computer program is set to learn from experience E with respect to some class of task T and performance measure P if its performance at task in T as measured by P improves with experience E. So that's exactly what we do when we learn something in the school or the university. So, uh, and there are, of course, many different definitions about extreme, but the idea is that the machine learns from the data about something. And this machine learning uh, applies everywhere right now. So it's a pattern recognition without explicit programming. It's quite flexible. Uh, it is very generic. So actually, no series in it. It's, uh, you can apply it to anywhere. anywhere and at some point, it has some predictive or even creative power. So you wouldn't believe that this machine which does that. And it has um, many applications like classification, uh, regression, so prediction, transcription, translation, anomaly detection in anything, in, in, in any any possible in any possible domain, denoising, so just improving photographs and some synthesis. So, for example, predicting the faces of people, just <laughs> just uh, generating them over machine learning. It has right now. It's, it's everywhere. And I In, uh, in 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 um, commerce, uh, uh, it's in, like in Google, you know, in translation because it, people can make money with that. So it's really really a big investment in science. It's also applied right now, but we use it kind of in secondary way, I would say. So we at some point maybe we will we just rediscover the bicycle next time or just trying to apply it to our needs. But it's extremely important as well. So and. Um, Okay, maybe you heard already that uh, it's already used to play the games. So like uh, it was uh, recently, it was the resignation of the of the uh, champion in Go after um, the, this deep mind won a lot of uh, a lot of games, uh, some competitions, and uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, not just just kind of publicity basically, but you sh you may know that. So it, for example, used in commercial companies like Grammarly, for example, when it's enhanced text processing, which shows you clarity, concision, vocabulary, predicts uh, you the text and gives you a nice writing. You start from simple phrase and gives you a very rich phrase with many different additional words, which you would which you know, but you wouldn't use them. So it just enriches your, your text. And also it's of course used in science. So recently there was big, big development in protein folding, uh, which was one, which is one of the greatest problem of life, I would say in biology. And also used in astroparticles, for example, classifications of rays of different types of gamma rays or you know, cosmic rays of um, different types of galaxies. Finding you have also big data um, image, you know, like Hubble makes many, many photographs and other, um, like at the neutron and uh, new, sorry, Newton and other uh, different laboratories. They make uh, they see uh, uh, like Chandra. It's, they see they make photographs of the pictures of space in different. Uh, um, bands like uh, gamma rays and uh, x-rays and so on. And uh, you can just classify what you see there. Do you see galaxies and so on? And uh, for example, recently it was used for lunar impact crater identification and age estimation, detection of fresh craters on Mars, NASA does that. So it's extremely, extremely useful technique. And uh, in general, uh, so the results uh, are compatible and sometimes superior to human to human experts, so machine network is sometimes much more, much faster, and uh, much superior in recognition. 
And really, generally, the performance is much better than any compared to any cluster algorithm. But there are serious drawbacks of that approach. You know, one of them is that it's black box. It's still, it's still a program. Some program which is quite complicated. It's made of simple elements, but together it becomes very complicated. It takes computer power. It looks like magic sometimes because sometimes we see, well, how can it be? And it's numerical. So you cannot get analytical results out of them. You can guess, you can explain how we can get it, but still it's a black box to us. So for us, machine learning algorithms will be using, will be using just to upgrade or complement complement existing standard Monte Carlo technique. So first principle Monte Carlo technique, or we can also use experiments, for example, to classify some experiments, but it's not a part of my talk. So it will help us to classify, to understand, to deal with this huge number of data which we have in our experiments or numerical simulations. But still it's a black box magic and it's numerical. Okay. And what is deep neural network? In fact, the general idea is extremely simple. <clears throat> So you have some input. Your input can be anything. It can be photograph. So just to pixelize it, it can be uh, some, um, in our case, it's learning configuration. Uh, it can be some history of anything, you know, of some, you know, some earthquakes, for example, some reading, so anything. So you can get any big data with many inputs. Input. So input, in the case, you can think of the photograph, it can be the, say, uh, the pixel. And you can characterize it somehow. So it should be color and intensity, for example. In my case, in the case of blue and QCD configurations, it will be just the uh, value of the field at some particular point and some particular direction. That's all. And there are many, many points on the lattice. So we split the point in terms of the lattice, and then we get it and we look at it. Um, just to get basically like a huge hologram, big, big hologram, uh, the slice uh, of just some, some, some configuration of gluons which appear in the vacuum, basically virtual gluons which are fluctuating there. That will be our, our QCD configuration. Okay, then uh, we input it. And then, uh, so every, every point, every X has some value corresponding to the value, for example, in my case, just the uh, strength of the field. So fields are fluctuating. It can be a thermal fluctuation, final fluctuations. I don't care, it's just value of the field. And then there are some uh, links. Okay, there is another layer. There is another layer which is called hidden layer. So usual neural network uh, con consisted before just with two layers, input and output. And deep neural network means that you have many, many hidden layers which are not seen because what you will see on the output, there are many, many intermediate layers which are connected to the first layer and the next layer. So here I wrote only one layer, but there are many, many of them in reality. You have many, many. And uh, there are between them, there are some links. So basically, what happens that uh, if you have here some values, then you send some of those values, for example, x1, x2, and x3, from one uh, layer to another layer with certain matrix operation. Here, uh, W is some n by n matrix. If you have n values, then if you have so-called deeply connected uh, layers, so they uh, each 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 point connected to each other point. They're deeply connected, so then you dense. They call densely connected, maybe better. So you have some matrix which relate to another layer. And this matrix in general is arbitrary. So, okay, it's not defined. You can have some classes of matrices, but in general case, it's some arbitrary matrix. And then once once those data come into that uh, neuron, so this part is called neuron right now, it comes to a neuron, neuron processes it. So basically what means that neurons apply some function to those entering points. For example, it can say, take average of them, and then apply some other function, which this ReLU function, for example, which say that um, you just average over all input values, and then you take a value, this call it value Xi, and then consider a function, which is Xi times uh, theta, theta of Xi. So theta is uh, unity when theta Xi is better than, bigger than one, and uh, zero when Xi is smaller than one. Or you can take sigmoid function, for example, which belongs uh, from unity, uh, from zero to unity. So it's very, very simple mathematical function. One shouldn't really invent anything there specific. It's some simple functions uh, which are applied, and then you get new layer. And this layer is uh, can be can have exactly the same number of uh, of points or of neurons or smaller number. So the idea is that to uh, make uh, those layers as less dense as possible. So then uh, consider next layer, then next layer, another layer. 
and then invent such uh, coefficients here, such matrices, in such a way that they solve your problem. So basically, it's um, yeah, it's set of course in for for non special a little bit strange way, but that's life. So <laughs> so and then at the end you get uh, so in the beginning you have huge configuration at the beginning. And at the end, you get something very simple. So you get basically output here. There are only two values. For example, one value says you what is in which phase you are right now, either confinement or deconfinement. So you have either zero or one, or it gives some characteristics. For example, in this case, it's the value of chiral condensate of mass gap or anything physical which you would expect uh, your theory contains and should contain. So in the beginning, you have big configuration with millions or billions of data. At the end, you have two simple output. That's exactly what we expect to get. Now the question is, uh, okay, does it work or not? In fact, in fact that, uh, in fact, uh, it, in general case, it doesn't work. So one should, you cannot just apply arbitrary matrix and uh, get new nice results. It's, it's impossible. You need to train this and to get a reliable answer. And by the way, sometimes answer is, as I said here, 42. It means that it's senseless answer. So you get some answer, but you don't understand what does it mean because it's totally senseless. So in general case, the system does not work. That's why, that's why, uh, yeah. And that's why we enter in so-called uh, learning technique or kind of uh, self-learning technique. I will, I will explain what does it mean. And, but uh, let me just explain also another thing that, um, that here there are, I said there are many different operations, many different connections, and what are the examples. So one of the example is the convolution. So it's uh, basically you have uh, some data. So here I said there are just only three input values. In reality, you have billions of them. But imagine that in that case, you have data which is organized like, you know, in this okay, kind of square picture. And then you apply a convolution technique, which basically says that you take some convolution matrix and then, then take, for example, in the case is three by three, and then uh, take some kind of filter, which here it means that zero minus one, zero minus one, five minus one, zero minus one, zero. And then uh, just convolute this matrix with other matrices and then construct new matrix. So, and that new matrix will also have the same dimension, this matrix, but it will be different right now, you see? So it's, it's, it's a little bit different. And the separation from mathematical point of view looks totally senseless because you basically, what you do, you just basically, what you do, you just linearly mix, 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 mix some data with each other. Moreover, since this matrix contains zeros, you forget about something, but that's exactly how, neurons work in um, uh, visual recognition systems of animals. So how cortex uh, of animals of say ego uh, operates to find mouse in the field. That's exactly this way how it works. So that's why people call it neutral, neuro, neurals, uh, neurons, because it was, uh, this idea was taken from nature. So that's, that's convolution. And then you can apply the convolution from one layer to another, adjusting the particular uh, weights here. And adjusting weights, Okay, that's, that's one thing. Another one, uh, there is so-called pooling. So you can just, for example, take here, it's similar a little bit to convolution. So you can just take, for example, here, some part of your coming matrix here, which comes in the beginning, for example, or some hidden layer and uh, transmit to next layer, not all the elements or not this type of, uh, not all this type of convolution, but just take some elements here, for example, like this, for example, take matrix and then take uh, divided by squares and then consider, for example, maximal values there. This, 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 this. That's also, you can, you can use it just for example, to reduce sizes of some pictures, like you type, you press it sometimes the, bottom at your program and say reduce size of my jpeg picture and it does a similar thing just make this pooling or you can consider averaging you take square element and then consider averaging of those elements which uh, and consider matrix which is twice smaller that's an idea so that's pooling there is also dropout that's random forgetting so you just take the uh, your data and forget randomly 50 percent of elements that's all that's also a step and turns out that's important it's extremely important to be able to forget in order to learn you need to forget if you don't have dropout it's difficult in many cases to make system learning to to force a program to learn something new so and then there is a question what how how program learns so uh okay i will come a little bit later to that the details but uh one should distinguish the learning of different types. Uh, one of them, okay, there are many of them, but there are two different classes. 
uh, one is with supervised learning and there is unsupervised no learning. So basically, you uh, at some point you say, okay, you say you take a program, you show a picture, and you say, okay, this is mouse, this is mouse, this is mouse, so this is cat, this is cat, this is cat. And then you give a big ensemble of very well structured data to the program. It learns and it learns to separate between between the two. Another one is unsupervised learning. When you don't actually say these are cats and these are, uh, say, mouses, you just give all the data and they say, okay, now let's classify it. Give a program to the problem, the problem to classify it, and the program should classify it itself. It's also possible. It also looks like magic, but there is a leave it alone, uh, leave network alone, and for some time and try to separate it between to concretize different classes of, of your objects uh, in, in the theory. So, and our aim in our particular work, we would like to learn confinement. So instead of pictures, what we will do, we will assume that uh, we will use some topological semi-classical structures or we, okay, we will use some configurations and uh, which we produce with Monte Carlo techniques. So these are first principle simulations of real vacuum. And then we will uh, under, we'll try to understand whether this program can um, understand uh, what kind of phase we have, whether we have confining phase or we have the confining phase. And then try to understand how, how this program learns. That was actually motivation. And uh, to give a little bit, okay, what I said before may be considered like a little bit like magical, totally understandable how it works. But uh, one should imagine that like the fitting technique, one can think about it like fitting technique. Let me come back a little bit, bit later. So with, with all those uh, procedures, when you start from one configuration, here we have some weights, here we have some specific, specific activation functions. What you can do, you can basically make some um, architecture here. So you can have many, many different layers. Here are you, according to your experience, program some specific activation functions. And then you say, okay, now let's do the following. Let me say, uh, let me just uh, feed my program, this particular program. Let me feed those input values. So some specific uh, configurations or photographs, anything. And then at the end, the program will give me some value here, say one or zero. For example, one is one will be, for example, cat, zero will be mouse. And then I say, okay, I give the to the program some data photograph of the mouse and then it gives me cat. I said, no, no, it's not correct. Come back. And then, so I will always tell to program what it is exactly. Is it cat and mouse? And program will try to adjust those parameters itself randomly or non randomly according to some scheme. And finally to fit them in such a way that it learns, uh, it gives me prediction of what is cat, what is mouse. That's supervising easiest uh, way how to, okay, not easiest, but uh, simple way how to, how to work with the code. And at the end, program will adjust such parameters in such a way that it really predicts what is cat, what is mouse. It's a very simplified way. Of course, it may not work. It may not work because you chosen, have chosen wrong functions here. So you can take different, I here presented two of them, but there are many of them. You can take another way and uh, try to get a gain and try to construct architecture and uh, try to understand how program works. And then there is an interesting point here why I say that, uh, how can you can ask me, okay, you just say me right now how to make a program. It's uh, not understanding, just making program. How can you use that to understand anything? So the idea is that uh, is the following. Then once you, um, when the program have chosen those weights in such specific way that it, say with 95% uh, correctly predicts nature of uh, the um, uh, of your configuration, for example, then you can look at those weights and see how those weights are distributed. So basically to say roughly, uh, if the program learns exactly how to predict configurations, how to predict physics, you can stop it and then kind of open brain and see how those weights are distributed around to understand what it found actually for you. And then after this preparation of the surgery, e-surgery, you can understand uh, what physics was uh, behind all that. So that's the simplest way how to explain how this neural network works. So in that, that way, we asked our question, okay, whether this technique works or not. So uh, we consider it modest, very modest aim. Uh, we took a very well-known toy model. Max, I'm sorry, I need mean to, yeah. to give it. I have yeah. a question from Utsuko. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, can we uh, go back uh, to slides? Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes, yes. This? Uh, this? Ah. No, no. Uh, there was this an one? activation. Ah, here. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Do we have some, uh, I mean, uh, these activation functions are uh, depend on the model. I mean, 
what is the uh, what is the uh, how can I choose which activation function is the correct one for our purposes? I mean, uh, yeah, I yeah, mean, you, you that, have some two examples, but it I mean, it is model yeah. dependent or just random or it is just uh, okay. Is, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah let, let me let Utko, let me just explain you. Uh, I have to jump forward and to show there is explanation, but the explanation is like that. Let me just come here. Sorry, I, I have to really really come. Okay, take some time. It's here. This is your machine learning system. Yes, I'm taking data in the stack box, mixing, 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 and then get answer. If answers are wrong, then I start again. So uh, okay. To say in scientific way, it means the following, that there is no system at all. So, I mean, to me, it was when I started to work here, I said that, okay, total total nonsense because uh, functions are simple. Uh, there is no good way to, to predict it. I mean, uh, okay, so it just looks like a magic in a sense. So you can come here and say it looks like a magic or a black box. You just mix, 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 put different parameters then experience comes so then you see how many layers you should construct you start from simplest models and you see okay these functions work better this force the worse but i would say there is no mathematical theory behind it uh, I, okay there are some normalization statements or um, the theory of course if you start from say i mean real biodynamics we you know that the theory is uh, gauge theory there should be gauge freedom which should be respected so that gives you some uh, some specific values for those okay some some of the constraints on those functions but in reality no there is no uh, single argument uh, physically motivated x to choose those functions except for some intuition that's all yeah so unfortunately it's not mathematics uh, yes uh, we can use some probabilistic methods to reduce guesses of variable functions yes if that that's called actually you know, usually you give architecture. So I mean, those functions yourself, those functions by definition, those functions may have some parameters. Uh, so you have some parameters inside each, each neutron and then neuron. And then once you have many, many, many configurations, so if you have big data, so you have statistical ensemble, then you can use probabilistic methods to reduce the range of those parameters. Right, that's correct. That's fine tuning that works. Basically this procedure should be considered like a kind of extremely big uh, fitting function, which is highly nonlinear. Um, it's some specific class of tasks and uh, specific class of configuration. And that's how it should work. So to me, it was completely, uh, I would say when I started to work with it, I, it was completely like a black box and completely unsatisfactory. I just decided to try because, okay, there is another method. Why, why not to try in our field? And then I was a little bit impressed with the results. So the results were quite interesting. Also, okay, let me just let me just let it continue because I'm really a little bit um, uh, in, the, in the kind of, in the, uh, uh, in, uh, in delay, I mean, I delayed a little bit. So let me just explain very briefly what the theory means, because every slide here may be, um, may be discussed within one hour, because uh, there are many topics, interesting topics here. For example, this slide. Uh, so what is compact QED? So we choose the theory, which co called compact QED in two plus one dimensions. So in two plus one dimensions means that uh, two special dimensions in one time. If we make weak translation, so we uh, move to the quick transformation to Euclidean space time. We will work with the cube. We will work with the cube, which will be discretized. This will be time that will be space. So, and then it will be compactified. So we just make uh, the uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions in all directions to simulate, uh, you know, not, not, not to do the specific boundary conditions. So it should be simple, simple to work and because they're actually quite big lattice. Uh, from the point of view of thermodynamics. Lagrangian of this model is very simple. It has just a new squared. It's like a Maxwell theory. With one exception, we assume that those fields are, ah, yeah, that's abelian theory, so it's G1 theory. We assume that those fields are compact or better to say in continuum language, they are singular. So they contain monopoles. So in that sense, you have field strength, which has two parts, one of them photon, photon part, another one monopole part. And what does it mean? It's the following. So if you would have, uh, if you couple the theory to matter to say to some fermions, charge fermions, then you would get that this theory would contain electric charge and also magnetic charge. So you will have both monopoles, direct monopoles, and on top of that fermions. So you would have monopoles and fermions together in this theory. In our case, we don't consider fermions because it's too complicated. This is enough. So without the theory, without fermions, 
So this the simple theory enough for us. But Maxwell equation in general case contains some trivial right hand side. And it's interesting that since uh, the monopoles, uh, we work with two plus one dimensional theory, the monopoles here are instantons. So they are just points. So in usual theory, in three plus one, uh, monopoles will be also particles. So fermions will be particles, the monopoles will be particles. In three plus one theories, in two plus one theories, fermions or charged particles will be still particles because they're particles from the very beginning. But monopoles in the, 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 the theory will become, will, will become uh, point-like objects. So, okay, this point-like trajectories, which means they're instantons. So once time goes up, so here's, for example, example, here is time, here is space. One time go, goes up, I mean, just increases. Then those monopoles, anti-monopoles, monopoles, anti-monopoles will, will flash around. So they will be kind of instantonic type of, uh, type of objects. And in this theory, where you have those monopoles and anti-monopoles, which appear uh, randomly in the vacuum at a zero temperature, uh, what happens is that uh, if you put in the theory electric charge and anti-charge in that vacuum field full of monopoles, then in that case, you will get the confinement. So you will get that your, um, your you'll get that your electric charges, uh, positive and negative charges, will be confined in the sense that if you put them together you will need infinite energy to separate them at infinite distance. So there will be linear confining regime. So the potential between monopole and anti oh, sorry, between quark and anti-quark will be proportional, will be linearly proportional to so-called string tension. So parameter of sigma. And uh, it, so it will take, so energy will be linear. And so to separate them at large distance, you will need, need huge energy. That's why we say that objects are confined together. You cannot separate them at infinite distance at all. And this strength tension is proportional to density of monopoles. This is analytical results in a result in dilute gas approximation, but let me just give it for granted. So it's uh, just say that Ramon is just density of monopoles. So you count number of monopoles, anti-monopoles, take modulus of, of monopole density, anti-monopole density, sum them together and get this quantity. So if monopole density is zero, there is no confinement because sigma is zero. Okay, that's, that's, that's this problem. This, this theory, and we know how to solve it. And we know how to solve it. Moreover, we know what happens with that. We know that uh, the theory has two phases. It has confining phase and deconfining phase at different temperatures. So the so zero temp at low temperature has confining phase at uh, large temperature it has deconfining phase. There is a phase transition which separates those two phases. And other parameters, as I said, this is Polyakov uh, loop. And this Polyakov loop, uh, okay, this Polyakov loop probes both phases, so it's zero here and non zero there. And uh, the dynamics, what happens in the theory, it happens uh, due to monopoles. Um, so, what happens, you let me just very briefly mention that. So, monopoles and anti monopoles, they form so called um, Coulomb gas at low temperatures. So, monopoles and anti monopoles, they interact in the three dimensional Euclidean theory uh, with exchange of photon. Uh, and the interaction between them like one over x basically it's like a usual coulomb interaction but once you increase temperature that one over x becomes confining but logarithmically confining and proportional to temperature in that case so when temperature becomes high monopole and anti-monopole gets gets um, uh, gets attracted to each other and they can form monopole anti-monopole pairs so what happens that okay let me come let me come further let me come further here so what happens here since i don't have so much time uh, uh let's see what's happened here that when, when you increase temperature from zero to okay from zero to infinity basically to large temperature you pass through confining the confining transition and at left hand side so at confining side at low temperature you get monopole anti-monopole gas so this kind of random anti-monopole monopole gas and if you take this gas and they put their quark and anti-quark or charge anti-charge and pull, pull them at large distance, the monopoles, anti-monopoles, they work like, they would work like, you know, like um, disordering agents. So they will disorder medium in such a way that <laughs> quark, those quark particles, antiparticles, I said quark and anti-quark because these are analogs of QCD. So they would start to try to, to, to be brought together and we interpreted this formation kind of effective string between quark and anti-quark or monopole, okay, uh, between charge and anti-charge. So, that, that's what happens. So here, monopoles they are working together to uh, confine uh, charge and anti-charge. Once we cross this deconfining temperature, then here uh, we get that monopoles, anti-monopoles, as I said, they start to confine themselves. They get confined. They form the pairs, and those pairs they have very short-range field in the sense that uh, it, it will 
it will decay much faster because they are screened together. You see, they are coming together as pairs. And therefore, this phase is the confinement because those pairs, they don't have enough field to disorder vacuum. And um, you will get just ordinary Coulomb interaction between uh, charge and T charge. So confinement is lost here. So we see that confining the confining transitions, they are related to each other as transitions between monopoles. So monopoles here form the gas, um, the gas of monopole and monopole gas. And here we have just a gas of monopole and monopole pairs, much weaker and less dense. And this, by the way, these are results in numerical simulations with real configurations. And then you can say, oh, yeah, it's nice that I see that this is just confining phase, this is the confining phase. So if I want to understand confinement, I have just to look to my monopole configurations, instruct them somehow from the vacuum. It's, it's easy. I mean, it's not still theory, it's easy on your simulations. I extract them, I compare them, and I see this is confining, this is, this is confining, this is the confining. Perfect. What's the deal? And now I say, oh, yeah, that's perfect, but it's perfect when you say it's sit really at low temperature or at high temperature. So low temperature is here and high temperature is there. But suppose you are sitting close to temperature transition. What's going on there? And you'll see that here we'll have this configuration and that configuration. Which of them is confining? Which is the confining? You don't know. So in reality, if you look carefully, where, where, where those configurations are obtained, you will see that this is the confining temperature, this is confining temperature. But how can we understand them? How, how can we estimate, estimate between them? Let's use right now machine learning. So what we do is the following, that we um, basically simulate monopole configurations in the theory. Then we consider them as three-dimensional holograms. So not just photographs with some pixels, but we consider like three-dimensional pixels. And each point in space corresponds either to empty space or monopole or anti-monopole. So we get kind of black-white, I would say, or black-gray-white pictures. And those monopole to monopole configurations are fed into the program. After that, uh, we train it. We say, okay, now we have confinement. This configuration is confining. This configuration is the confining. And we try uh, to feed this to the program, which I said before, which I described before. And uh, it learns, it adjusts weights. And after that, we give to the configuration new unknown data and say, okay, please say us where we are, whether we are in confining phase or the confining phase, and try even to calculate some quantities from there. And I must say that um, there was one uh, quite interesting work five years ago, which was published, I think, in Nature or Nature Physics B, or sorry, in Nature of Nature Physics. Uh, this work um, actually say that, in fact, it's uh, how much, how the system learns um, what is the phase transition. I mean, I mean, how how the um, neuron artificial neural network can predict whether we have phase transition or not whether we are close to phase transition or far away from it and that's exactly it turns like exactly like a person so I, when i show you this configuration you say yes yes this confining then i show this configuration you say yes is this the confining and why i said oh yeah because it's there are many monopoles here and they're distributed you know randomly around and here there are only monopole anti monopole pairs and there are a few of them so you know that but one once i give you this Two configurations and try to say you okay could you please guess what is what which is confined which is the confining you are confused you're confused you don't know which one of them exactly and that's exactly what happens with the neural network you can identify some quantity which is called kind of you can call it confusion measure and when neural network get confused basically doesn't know what to predict to you or give some random predictions that means it's confused so that means that you are at the, the confining regime okay you are at confining the confining regime, you are very close to the phase transition. So it's exactly the same as usual uh, person would do. Numerical simulation based on or uh, artificial neural networks would do exactly the same. So uh, we can learn about phase transition just by confusion. So basically, let me just again go a little bit further because I a little bit stopped at the very beginning explaining what QCD is um, and how what is a phase diagram there. So I need to take a little bit more time. So, uh, so our objectives are the following. Just what we do, we just take um, a theory at some lattice. Our lattice is basically uh, time, time direction is four, space direction is, for example, 16, or we take also six, uh, four, six, eight in time direction. And in space direction, we take 16 and 32, for example. And then we simulate our theory in the lattice, uh, create, just generate monopole configurations or look to original gauge fields and basically generate many, many configurations. In this particular work, we considered only monopole and monopole configurations. 
Then we took a neural network in more or less simplest way. So we have convolution and dense layers. So all layers are connected to each other, all, all, all neurons are connected to each other. And we have some specific conv convolution matrices, which basically operate, uh, basically smooth, smooth all data, this uh, big uh, input uh, hyper, um, I would say, holog big hologram consisting of monopoles and antimonopoles as the pixels and use supervised learning techniques. So the simplest one we know at the beginning what is monopole, what is uh, what is confined phase, what is non confining phase. Uh, the number of parameters is huge, more than one million of parameters. So it's not usual fitting, but still it works. And our architecture is quite complicated. I will flash it briefly. You can look it later. I will uh, send my P PDF file or we can talk later because I'm, my time is going going out of that. So basically what's going on, we just uh, have some input of monopoles and then we have different uh, different activation uh, layers. We have some normalization functions. We have pooling, uh, we have dropout. Dropout means they just, just randomly forget about some, some pixels, saying that they're not important. And the system learns itself. So it adjusts parameters to come back and uh, to predict the confining the confining regimes. It says us whether we, what kind of polycore loop we have, what is the value of polycore loop, predicts and predicts also our monopole characteristics. Okay. And then, uh, yes, and as I said that we have vast, it was a question before, we had a vast diversity of different architectures. And we have, uh, so our choice of this particular architecture depends on us. We have chosen that because it works very well. So we just make it more and more complicated. And that is the result. So basically this, okay, this first analytical, oh, sorry, numerical result. So we have here beta, which encodes temperature. So here beta is lattice beta function. Okay, beta function, lattice beta, for a specific uh, quantity which uh, encodes lattice function. And uh, mm. it, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and it basically corresponds to increasing temperature. When we increase beta, we increase temperature in lattice units. So as temperature increases, the monopoles get rarefied, and finally we get the confining transition between confinement phase and the confinement phase. And uh, then we fit all that uh, to the lattice. So we just trained it at some specific a few points here and there, but not at the transition point, really far away. And then we just what we do, we just basically uh, give kind of training course. So we give configuration and say, okay, now I just parameters which uh, describes that this is a confining phase. So we give it a polycom loop, which we know, and try to for 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 the program to adjust its parameters in such a way that uh, the uh, it predicts uh, polycom loop very well. So and it actually takes not so many configurations, like only two thousand configurations to to uh, learn to uh, to learn the parameter and then to validate them. So to validate, I would say that it's it's kind of optimized them very well. Sorry, just I have no time to really talk, to go into deep details. But once the program learns, it uh, you can then ask the different questions. So suppose the program learns uh, the configurations, you can say whether we can predict, uh, um, I mean, for example, value of polycore loop. And here, for example, beta is temperature, and here is the value of polycore loop, and it is distributed to the raw configuration. This is histogram. This is real histogram. And this histogram, which uh, artificial network predicts given uh, just configurations. And when it predicts, you see that fluctuations are much smaller. So it basically reduces noise. So artificial network uh, allows you to, to reduce just usual noise, what we call perturbative physics, which is totally unessential to, to confine the confining, uh, and the thing of confining the confining phase transition. So, you know, in, 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 in the non-perturbative physics uh, in QCD, confining pro problem is non-perturbative problem. So it means that all small fluctuations of field does not matter. And uh, here we see that uh, artificial network learned that small fluctuations are not important. So data are much less noisier than the data of original configurations, which is full of perturbative noise. And when we come uh, finally to, I would say the final transparency, also kind of pre-final transparency here, uh, actually I will have a little bit more discourse here. So we have here predictions. Uh, these are predictions. It's a beta function, basically consider this temperature, and uh, you can here predict, for example, look for say uh, usual, okay, usual Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo prediction for polycore loop, how it changes from small temperatures where we have confining phase to the confining phase at large temperatures, and here is prediction for monopole density, or oh, sorry, for for polycore loop coming coming from machine learning techniques. So it's a little bit different one. And the same is here, say these are different like sizes. So you have real prediction and the prediction coming from, from okay, real results and prediction coming from machine learning. 
and also the same for monopoles. For monopoles, the relation is a little bit better. But I would say that uh, real value of molecular group is not important. It's important where transition is, where the curvature of this uh, line is, is the biggest one. And then uh, also the system predicts, as I said, predicts whether we sit in monopole, or sorry, in confining phase or in deconfining phase. And here, what is critical here is the, that uh, this is just basically different lattice configurations, different flows on the system. And uh, here was critical bit of critical bit of what say it's in, in continuum languages typical uh, critical uh, temperature, and here is a result given say by nature so by Monte Carlo which is valid result, and here is machine learning result uh, which predicted by machine learning and you see that the data are lying quite close to each other so there is some deviation here say ten percent, but you give configuration and machine learning system try by confusion find where it is, it is confused more. And it predicts that indeed you have phase transition in this particular system and it gives you the, uh, the phase transition that it, it appears here. So it's more or less good. So we see that it's good. However, we don't know, let me just, I will take a little bit more time because I was a little bit, uh, took too much time for me just discussing the, uh, what, what is QCD. I mean, I would like to, a little bit to demonstrate that, uh, the question that, uh, okay, we see here that uh, in this toy model, things work, but in reality, I must say that we don't know why. So we see that things are working, prediction is working. So, I mean, it can predict with 10% or even sometimes better, uh, predict the position of first transition. So you take some, give some limited number of configuration gives you, and then give different configurations which program have not seen before and can really discriminate between confining and deconfining phases. But we failed to understand why. I really, we failed. We don't understand. We, we prepared this brain, and but we don't see. We don't see why it is so. How a system learns itself. So it's, it's for us, it was a black box. How decision is made. So it's, it's still a dream. And to ask this question again, and maybe in a real configuration, in the real world, we took next step and we considered it the SU and the theory. So basically, we considered gluons. SU2 and SU3 gluons. So SU3 is a part of real QCD, SU2 and this more simplified system. So we take two types of, we have two different types of young also systems. And what we did, we again, this is again the, the phase diagram. So we believe that uh, we can really simulate, we can really, really use this lattice uh, QCD or lattice annual theory to understand what's going on with confinement here at low densities. And again, uh, to study right now, gluodynamic configuration. So we removed uh, fermions and just said, okay, consider only gluodynamics where we have confinement, deconfinement, and try to guess what's going on. And then after guessing, let's move in that direction. Try to kind of to use um, uh, machine learning as a useful tool to come to, to, to high baryon density and to try to make prediction at high baryon density regions, which is actually impossible for any numerical method at all. So that was an idea. And uh, yes, and then what we did, uh, let me just very briefly mention that we tried to do the following thing. We tried to give, to prepare that, we tried to give to the, to the machine learning uh, system, to artificial network, the impossible problem. So what we did, we did the following. We took a uh, very bad lattice configurations and tried to, um, to ask the, um, ask the um, machine, to predict the reconstruct to us order parameter which was calculated at that particular bed regime. But bed regime, I mean that we took configurations which are have very, very small volume. So we took lattice gate theory at extremely small volume, and this extremely small volume means that you don't have any confinement there. It's just complete artifact. So it's just something which which is similar, which is a little bit similar to that region. So if you would like, for example, to study high baryon density regime, it's very bad to start from that region because there is no density here. You need to have some small density at least to come from low density point to high density point. So what we did, we did similar thing but with gluodynamics. We said, okay, we start from very, very bad point uh, where there is no confinement at all. And then try to ask system, could you please learn what is the confining phase transition should be here? Or what is the confining, okay, what is confining parameter? and uh, the um, uh, order parameter should be which can distinguish between two phases and then try to predict phase diagram from try to reconstruct it so okay this is uh, our uh, architecture of our neural network again this is input 
configuration that we have some convolutions. Again, now we consider convolutions of four-dimensional configurations. So we have quite complicated, complicated convolution system. We have pooling again, drop out uh, at some point. Uh, yes. And uh, what we did, let me just come to the results here. So results are the following. So we, this is polycov loop, and this is beta, like is beta, which basically temperature, I would say, at some with some, with some normalization. So here, this point corresponds to the confining phase, and this point corresponds to confining phase. And here we have Monte Carlo simulations, which are orange, and then we have blue uh, machine learning predictions. And we trained in this particular region, which corresponds to high temperature regimes, or given the finite size of our lattices, it's very, very small lattices, physically small lattices. And we uh, asked the system to predict uh, the um, order parameter at this particular point. So we calculated the order parameter and then say, okay, now with configuration, try to make an efficient way how to predict it then, those small lattices, and then try to extrapolate it through all, all the space, just uh, in such a way that we give only your configurations, which we measured, and then try to predict us from those configurations, the order parameter. And you see the coincidence is really here fascinating. So the system is able to reconstruct physical quantity from the demand. And uh, without knowing what is reconstructing, what only new values. So input was huge number of data, millions, billions of data, and they, they only knew the answer of what should it be, and it found find the way how to reconstruct it. And it happens. It, this good predictions happened at many different uh, blue dynamics. It was SU2 blue dynamics, SU3 blue dynamics, so different types of colors and different sizes. Here, plots are diff just different by just by lattice sizes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was very accurate prediction of the transition point in the case of blue dynamics. So uh, I would say that uh, the summary, uh, I'm sorry, I need to be um, extended my talk for eight minutes. So the summary, I hope that it was entertaining at least. <laughs> so the summary is the following. So uh, can the, can the uh, machine learning uh, or artificial network with a good training recognize confinement uh, using topological objects? In that case, monopoles, which we produced uh, by Monte Carlo and uh, gave to, uh, the, to, to, the, uh, to the neural network. The answer is yes. So it's possible. You really see it's very nice. It works nicely. Then um, can it find the order parameter uh, of a phase transition? Yes, it also can find. So you can give configuration, not know what should be order parameter, or you know what should be order parameter, but you can ask whether the system can guess it itself. And it's possible with reservation. Yes, it's possible. Even even if you get very bad configuration, give very bad configuration to system, it also will learn uh, what it should be the order parameter. And then the main question from which I started was motivation. Can we understand the mechanism of confinement in your theory with machine learning? So the answer is no. Okay, at least not yet, because we don't understand. We tried. Uh, it was our dream, but it did not work. So too much data, too much preparation, surgery, and we could not find what's going on there, unfortunately. And I think nobody knows how to use machine learning exactly to do that. But the nice point that uh, this technique allows to reduce number of data much, much to much smaller number of sets and people still work uh, in this direction. And so in future developments, what will happen then? So we can use uh, artificial neural networks with Monte Carlo to find, uh, we hope still to find what kind of learning configuration is responsible for color confinement in your theory, and then use the um, this technique to come to finite density regime of blue dynamics of, of sorry of QCD because right now lattice simulations can use only uh, can work only with this very very small domain around temperature transition uh, I mean zero I mean, zero density finite temperature transition which is okay very well explored right now and which is far away from for example neutron stars or color superconducting regimes which are very interesting we don't know nothing about that from the point of view of numerical simulations or first principle results. So that's that's our dream how to move. Okay, I finished. Thank you very much for the for listening. So let's thank uh, Maxime for his talk. You, yeah. Are mute and, uh, yeah, yeah. I, ho I hope I, I gave some flavor at least because it was very difficult to. Uh, to explain it in a very short moment. And also you said that it's a mathematical workshop, but okay, mathematically oriented uh, or mathematically oriented group, but uh, it's difficult to explain it, but I hope that I give some flavor. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah, you're welcome. So I, I'm ready to, to, to answer questions. So if you have. Um, I have a question uh, from my side, but uh, yeah, uh, so um, maybe they are uh, just uh, to trivial uh, with respect of, um, yeah, I come from a mathematic, um, mathematical yeah, perspective. Yeah, so, it's not uh, mathematics at all, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering just for the, uh, the don't, for passing from uh, confinement to the confinement, so the critical temperature is just one value. So it's one value that uh, lets you uh, pass from a confinement to uh, yes. a deconfinement to a confinement. Yes, it's one value. It's for, for every theory, it's only one value. Mm. The problem is that in QCD, let me just say that in QCD, it's a blurry region, it's a smooth region. So, it's, you know, like if you consider water, for example, at high pressures, so you have done, you reached end point of, say, of transition between vapor and uh, liquid. So, at some point, you get vapor. And at some point, you see that you don't really see the uh, the confining. Okay, sorry. Okay. Kind of, um, so, but this is the reason why uh, when, when you try to look to the, the monopoles, you, because you have said, if I understood right, that uh, there are, uh, we can decide uh, it in some region. We can we cannot see on the images uh, for uh, for the yeah. the diagram of poles. So the confusing part. So yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so let me say like that. So if you, for example, if I give you a configuration, to give you one configuration, and you see like a human, you will see on it just just you know it's just like that. For example, this configuration. You don't know which is it. Is it confining or deconfining? Because it's like that. So you have some objects which know these objects in this particular sphere. We know that these objects are responsible for confinement. We know that very well, analytically, numerically, we know that. And okay. still there are problems because uh, you cannot at some point, just as a human, you cannot understand yeah. what is that. Is it confining so or deconfining? It's a lack of information. So it's a problem and lack of, we don't have enough information to decide. So this is. Uh, uh, I, I would say, no, no, no. I would say enough knowledge. I would say so. If you look to the picture, you cannot recognize is it confining or deconfining. Uh, I would say differently. Of course, you can have this association. So you have a little bit deconfinement at confining part and uh, vice versa. But once you have very big configuration, very big, big configuration. These are small, but very big configurations. I, 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 I would like to ensure you will have something like that. You will see configurations which will be very similar to each other. But one of them will be confining, another one will be deconfining. And as a human, you cannot differentiate between them. And you know, yeah. in real life, you have many examples like that when you see some mirage, uh, say, say yeah. for example, this desert, and you know if it's real or not real, or many, many limited in our real life. And we kind of confused in a sense. Uh, so here is something similar. So we would like to use uh, artificial neural network to. Uh, discriminate between the two uh, type of configurations and it's possible but we know that when okay to find transition region but the idea how the system works it's exactly like human works so it comes and when it gets confused so when you does not know which one is which one i mean it means that you're very close to phase transition and that it predicts it's more or less with good accuracy actually our accuracy was not so good but it's due to finite okay not so good five percent but it's due to finite resolution of lattice if you would take larger lattice i would i'm pretty sure it will be a hundred percent i mean one percent within one or zero point one percent resolution it will be very good yeah okay yeah, so I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I think uh, I have uh, one more question, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if there is someone else. And oh, okay, so I will ask my uh, my last question. This is called, so if I understood right, so in the training process, uh, so what yeah. we are doing here is uh, a supervised training. Yes. So, yes. so a supervised training, and uh, we have a, a data of the 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 monopoles, the image of uh, monopoles. Yes. And yes, yes. I was wondering, just um, like the, the data that we use it to the monopoles, and uh, like so, uh, at some point in this dat data, each data we have uh, the, the answer. So in the training process, we have the answer if it is a uh, confinement or a deconfinement. So this is given in the uh, data. I was wondering how we yeah. uh, we have arrived to this uh, conclusion for the training data. Is it using the Monte Carlo? Uh, Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, so the idea is that 
you basically have your data set. So it's important to have data set. Uh, in our case, data set are monopole configurations, which you generate using Monte Carlo. It's kind of completely foreign, I mean, kind of external procedures. So it's just generated our data set and gather. You can consider this like taking picture from real world. You know, sometimes Google asks you to recognize whether you see bridges, cars, or planes, and click to really show that you are human to pass to the system, for example. So that's similar thing. So we generate many, many, many pictures, but these are pictures of mon monopoles, and we treat them as a hologram, so three-dimensional images. Yeah. Black, white, great images. Okay, we did it. And then uh, we use, then we construct some, um, let me show if I have shown that, we uh, make some architecture, very specific architecture uh, to our, of our artificial neural network. So it means that we have here monopole inputs, very big matrices. And then we have some steps, which I, I mentioned a few yeah. of them before. So we have some convolution, activation, so we pass basically from one layer to another layer. And that's, that system is a kind of point which is, um, uh, let me just give you a feeling because details are maybe not so much important. This point which put every mathematician, I would say, into some kind of, uh, you know, stop mode, you know, for the mode, because it's totally undefined, I would say, naively. So you, procedure depends on particular data set. So you see, in this particular way, we found that this way is uh, working, but it's not just a copy of something else. We just took it, we put one layer, we say, oh, it doesn't work. Then let's do it. Oh, it works better, but still. And then do it another one, another one, another one. So data is reduced, reduced, reduced. So from very big configuration, the very beginning, say millions of data, millions of numbers, we get at the end, we get quantities like prediction of whether we have confinement or deconfinement. So basically zero or one, or vicinity between the okay, kind of measure probability between zero or one. Then we have Actually, that was uh, my question, yeah. Maxim. So for example, when we, uh, if we advise, for example, uh, in uh, algorithm like Google algorithms, so we have uh, data and the, uh, in the training process, we have humans that uh, decide. So this, they saw the picture yeah. of uh, a cat. They say, this is a cat, this is a dog. So yeah, the yeah. supervision is given by a human. So I was uh, wondering yes. the supervision here is how we, uh, if we look at the, at the monopole, who decides, so uh, who decided ah, ah, ah. in the, in the, data, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. data training? Yeah. Oh, so that's, that's very what... simple, that's very simple. Yeah, that's extremely simple. We basically, we control it. We can simulate temperature at different temperatures, simple theory. So we simulate the theory here and we simulate the theory there. So here is confining, all configurations will be like that, thousands of configurations. Here is the confining, all configurations like that. And we then say, okay, now take this bunch of configurations, say 2000 configurations and treat them as the confining configurations and then learn what is the confinement. Now, the same program comes here and then now we get this, those configurations. Now let's use the same program to identify confining configurations and system now tries to adjust adjust the parameters to find that it's working at confining uh, phase you see so we decided it in the beginning so we generated like you do can do you take your cat and make me many pictures of your cat now it's data data set of cats, okay. so confining okay, okay. Uh, and then the confining so, so that was a program it was a program okay, and yeah. then after that we just say okay now we show you worst thing we show you those configurations which we humans cannot understand whether it's confinement or the confinement and then give us answer and that's very interesting <laughs> how okay. we do that yeah thank you thank you for answering yeah, you're, uh, yeah, yeah, you're welcome yeah 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 you're welcome yeah let me give you one very very short uh, kind of appetizer extremely appetizer kind of conclusion you know just okay but I, I think that people are a little bit more i kind of um, maybe confused because it's really confusion. Also, there is some beautiful mathematics there. There is normalization groups there. You know, uh, it's interesting. There is there are flows there, and it's uh, the system when you have a lot of data. It's uh, it has some beautiful mathematics behind it in terms of statistics, I would say. But it's not uh, not exactly this talk. Uh, I would not. <laughs> yeah, maybe some, some other occasions. Yeah. Yeah, but let me give you one example here. It's what what I would call it. What I would call it um, uh, better. Just very very short. Just one minute or two three minutes. It's about let's take a summary. It's a little bit fashionable extension, which is called getting a bit of vacuum energy with help of artificial intelligence. It's for New York Ta New York Times. It's not for, <laughs> but for journal, but it's actually published in journal. So Casimir Energy with Machine Learning. Let me very briefly mention that because it can be used also for good things, not only for something which is far away, you know, Big Bang or uh, you know, smashing your atoms together or ions together, sorry. Uh, it's kind of done maybe in technological, in technological respect, but let me just give one example. You know, we have Casimir effect, 
Casimir effect is uh, simple effect. So when you have uh, two plates, two, two, two plates, let's say metallic plates, put them together, those plates, which are uh, totally neutral, assumed to be totally neutral, will be uh, will be attracted together due to fluctuations, vacuum fluctuations. So it's called Casimir effect. It uh, proves basically the existence of uh, vacuum zero point energy. And it was measured. It was measured, real measured, not calculated, but measured real experiments long time ago. 30 years ago, or actually 20 something years ago, first time it was measured. So at the human scale, or not subhuman scale, basically at a few nanometers, micrometer scale, and it was really seen that indeed neutral objects they attract or repel depending on configuration. Uh, so, so vacuum energy does exist, or at least this Casimir effect does exist. So plates, neutral plates, neutral vacuum fluctuations, they can can attract. The problem here is that to calculate this thing is extremely complicated. It's uh, uh, you can only calculate it only in some simple geometries. If you change a little bit geometry, it becomes totally complicated. And even for say, for example, interaction between plate and sphere, it's quite uh, difficult numerical work to do that to do the calculation. That's a problem. So we decided to use machine learning. So what we do, <laughs> just I will flash very briefly. Don't take your time. So I take some, we take some theory similar to say say uh, electrodynamics, but simplified form. So we take scalar theory with one degree of freedom, so simplified way. And uh, this is just a real world field. And we say that, OK, now we can uh, put the theory, say, in 2 plus 1 dimension or 3 dimension, and then put some boundaries, boundaries at any configuration, say, and then calculate is Monte Carlo or other technique, uh, Casimir effect, and then give it to machine learning system just to learn what is the uh, Casimir energy. And then use this predictive power of this machine learning of this artificial neural network technique to uh, system to predict uh, Casimir energy for new configurations which were not seen by the system. So the idea is basically like that. So we have some neural network. I just flash it here. We have uh, some examples. So we know analytically example when we have two parallel lines, basically two parallel plates together. We know analytically what is Casimir, what is interaction between them, what is the force of attraction. But now what we did, we just put different types of boundaries. We just generated them. You see different, 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 different directions, different corrugations, different fluctuations. The only one one uh, one requirement was they don't they don't touch each other. But otherwise they can be arbitrary. And we can also consider the form cycles of different types. These are cycles generated numerically. So also different types. And we got them and then we gave it to the program. So what is here, just you may not even you look at it. So just we took different types of uh, cycles, uh, feed it to the code, uh, to the neural network, and then uh, just generated new cycles or new types of parallel lines which were corrugated and then asked the system, okay, please give us the uh, value of Casimir energy. And it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> For example, here is the result of say three-dimensional configuration. We have some configuration one, okay, it's just naively this way, so just a tube of this type particular shape. And uh, the program have not seen it before, but it's trained. The Monte Carlo results, so natural result is minus 22, 62, and this is the result of machine learning. And here is the same. So results are pretty much the same. So analytically, it's totally impossible. Numerically, it's really difficult task. Uh, after training, machine learning system gives you immediately answer within seconds. I mean, real configuration takes you hours, it can take hours, or I don't know, it depends on computer, of course, you can take days or maybe minutes, but okay, it's, it takes a computer. But machine learning gives you immediately answer and with very good precision. If you look those configurations, they're actually not selected. It's a random configurations that are shown here. It, it gives numbers within uh, just a very small part of the percent. So I would like to say that this uh, system has big power and it's amazing. So to me, it was like a magic a little bit. At least here, it's just very good prediction of uh, Casimir energy or vacuum energy from basically from nothing. Just after training, it gives you a very good prediction. Yeah, okay, so I finished now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a creative question a little bit. Yeah. Uh, do you think that considering caviar and collisions, do you think that uh, the machine learning techniques would be comparatively easier method to predict the physics in the quark gluon plasma? I think they are right now used right now, effectively, you know, they are used uh, right now, but they use basically to understanding of what's going on inside the 
the core gluon plasma and sense how to reconstruct exactly what's coming, what, what's, what's appearing there. I mean, it's the following. So basically, um, before to understand what is inside, uh, I would say energies, you know, or what kind of, um, whether you have some, you know, some hydrodynamic flows, for example, inside, what are, uh, I would say to reconstruct what is temperature, for example, you need to learn um, basically from the hadronized data. Uh, you need to learn what happened at that one yoke per second inside. So basically what you do, you just uh, measure all particles which appear from the plasma, the hadrons, and then you trace them backwards in time and try to get uh, to understand what happened when they all were at the same point. So what what is what is the distribution of energies uh, or what particle number multiplicities? What happened at exactly this point where they were together, where they just hadronized after the fireball expanded, it cooled uh, down to normal hadronic temperatures, I mean, to, to the confining temperatures. And to reconstruct, people normally use Monte Carlo technique. Yeah, so it's uh, more also supercomputer technique to kind of to guess what was which particle interacted with which particle and uh, to reconstruct uh, what appeared there. For example, one of the recent advances were that um, uh, people could measure so-called lambda hyperons, which were actually relatively long-living particles, which can travel millimeters or even centimeters, like eight millimeters out of plasma, which is huge distances, like billions, it's billions of miles basically, <laughs> according to micro micro scale and you need to reconstruct them and but they are decaying they decaying to <clears throat> they decay to various decay channels including the proton and you need to understand which proton comes from decay of uh, lambda hyperon and not from they from just come from organ plasma itself so you need to measure all particles and reconstruct their trajectories where they appeared and whether they match each other some particular mass and that's complicated and machine learning technique allows to as far as I understand according to papers accelerate that and uh, to learn exactly the state of global plasma, which happened at hadronization stage, which for us is kind of horizon of vision. So that's, that's indeed happened. But what happened inside problem plasma, that's already for the not artificial brain, I'm afraid, but for the real brain. Uh, also, also, as I said, we still believe to take this machine learning program, for example, this one, it looks simple, quite. Right? Then kind of cut it there and say, okay, what kind of weights this program gave to uh, neuron connections which allowed us, which allowed this program to predict with this astonishing accuracy. You see, you can compare those lines, uh, uh, the, the energy uh, of uh, vacuum energy for those particular boundary conditions. Let me remind you that it's, they are not calculable analytically, it's total, total numerics. So that's an idea, but it, still to me, it did not work. So it, it's not practical at all at the moment. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how to do that, unfortunately. So it's motivation, I said, but it's aim of the talk. I would say, but it's not reached. As motivation, it's fine. So we used it as motivation. Uh, I think uh, from uh, a bit uh, philosophical perspective is, is just, it's as uh, the machine learning uh, technique predict that there is a future, uh, that uh, there is uh, like some property uh, which is much more uh, simple to calculate, but uh, we, uh, but the method, the direct method, use uh, another property, uh, pro property to predict, which is uh, more difficult to calculate. Maybe uh, if I understand yeah. something uh, like that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe yes. <laughs> okay. So maybe yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. So, so scientists use the okay in in, in, commerce, uh, in commercial applications, people use machine learning to make money and quite successfully, I would say, very very successfully. Okay. And uh, here we want to understand nature, and I would say at the moment it uh, works like kind of kind of help, you know, for example, we're constructing those tracks, we're constructing uh, the collisions, you know, when it's a high end collisions or particle collisions, we construct histories of particles. It works more efficiently sometimes than usual Monte Carlo course, like direct calculation much, much easier and faster. Yes, that helps. But to substitute of our brain, it's at the moment it's impossible. So at the moment we were not able to uh, really to understand why, uh, what is the confinement in PCD. And uh, even in this particular way, when, when I discussed when the simplest model, we can predict uh, phase transitions quite well, but we don't understand why it is so. So we uh, know that black box, black box works, so it works quite efficiently and fast. It's really, really very fast. So uh, especially, you know, especially this this last my appetizer. Um, yeah, okay, an appetizer, 
final final transparency sign. We have this Monte Carlo prediction for really hardly really difficult uh, to calculate quantity. It gives us very fast, very nice. To me, it was impressive, really impressive. But still, we don't understand why. So it's a good tool, but only numerical tool, unfortunately, at the moment. So let's see what happens in the future. We don't know yet. There is any thoughts or comments? If there's any final thoughts, we can close the meeting. Thank you, Maxim, uh, for this. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for invitation. Yeah, thank you for invitation. I hope to have, find another way to come to to the to the if it's, if it's suitable in time, we will surely come to to your your nice series. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. much. But we can announce the next uh, meeting, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can announce the next meeting. Um, I'm an ormeto, maybe present. Um, okay, so we so the the schedule of the seminar is um, once every uh, two weeks. So the idea is we alternate between uh, uh, physicist and uh, mathematician. Mm -hmm. And uh, so next uh, next talk will be uh, Thomas Richard, uh, who is a geometer in uh, University of Paris Escrité. So it will be uh, he, so a subject about uh, geometry. So I do. Uh, you can find the details uh, of the talk uh, on the website. So uh, I hope uh, uh, we will see you again in in two weeks. So this is a <laughs> Okay. Bye bye. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you. Bye.